everybody. Are you all settled? Thank you so much for coming. I'm Rhoda Shermer, and I want to welcome you on behalf of North Jersey Public Policy Network. I want you to bear with me for a few minutes because I have a few thank yous and a couple of announcements to make before we uh, get on with our wonderful program for tonight. Um, the thank yous go to Fairleigh Dickinson University, who's a great partner, uh, and we're very willing to open this auditorium for us, despite the fact that everybody's on spring break and they're all gone and the place was supposed to be locked up. So we really appreciate that. Also, because Fairleigh Dickinson usually provides refreshments, we had to get two volunteers to help with some of the refreshments. And I want to thank Jan Livingston and Judy Kraft for the delicious cookies. And I hope you enjoy them. I'd like also to thank our co-sponsor, the Bergen County uh, Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, and the generous support from the Puppet Foundation. Good partners also. The announcements I'd like to make are about our upcoming programs. Many of you, I think, are not familiar with North Jersey Public Policy Network, but what we do is we educate. We bring distinguished experts to bring authoritative information on key public policy issues to the public. And we conduct our programs primarily here at FDU, but we also do them at other venues also. So if there's a topic that you would like covered, you can always get in touch with us. And maybe there's a venue closer to where you live that we can provide a program. So I would like you to know that we have a few great programs coming up. And the one we're having on March 26th will be at Ramapo College. And that is with the um, Professor Kevin Trenberg, who is internationally renowned as a climate scientist who was one of the lead scientists on the team that won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And he will be updating us on uh, climate data, weather disruption, and what to expect from the uh, upcoming UN meetings uh, later this year. And that should be a great program at Ramapo College. And then we're doing a program with Ramapo High School. Uh, and there they asked us to do the topic of student debt loans uh, access to college and other economic issues. And we have two distinguished experts, one from the Federal Reserve Board and another from the Blousey School at Rutgers. And that program is on April 30th at the Ramapo High School in Franklin Lakes. Then on May 11th, we have Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz coming and he'll be at Bergen Community College on May 11th. He'll also have his new book, coming out, I think, the end of April, and he'll be willing to sign copies. So that's a good program to attend also. Uh, we are gonna end our season uh, with, on May 21st and have a concert uh, celebrating Pete Seeger. We have three singer-songwriters who will not only sing the repertoire of the Seeger um, repertoire, but also their own songs uh, that are in his tradition. So these are all great programs consider attending them. And if you're not familiar with us, please go to our website, njppn.org. Okay, no more delays. Um, I'd like to introduce you to somebody awesome. It happens to be Donna Dees Thomases. Now Donna is the woman who organized the Million Mom March that took place on Mother's Day back in 2000, and she's been active ever since. But she's done other things in her other life, uh, with CBS, with the Dave Letterman Show, and even at the White House. And she's quite an amazing person, and I want you to help me welcome Donna Dees, Thomas is the moderator for tonight. It was August 10, 1999, in Granada Hills, California, when a white supremacist, criminally ill, mentally ill man stormed a day camp and uh, shot 70 rounds, injuring five, including three children. Uh, two were four and five years old, and there was a 16-year-old uh, camp counselor. 
and I, at the time I lived in Short Hills, New Jersey, and Short Hills just sounded a little bit too much like Granada Hills, California. And that's why I first got involved, but very quickly I realized that right in my own um, county, Essex County, in Newark, the gun violence in Newark, and I've become very involved with the mothers there, and they work every day to keep their communities safe, so that's how I got involved. And we have a very, very distinguished panel here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, have each uh, panelist uh, spend 15, 20 minutes or less about why they got involved and what their background is and what their positions are. And um, they're going to have some questions among themselves or you may have questions. We'll leave that to the end. So our first panelist is Adam Skaggs, who is senior counsel at Every Town for Gun Safety. Adam oversees Every Town's litigation efforts and works on a wide range of firearms legislation at the state and federal level. Before joining Every Town, Adam was senior counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where he worked on issues related to money and politics, judicial independence, and voting rights. Prior to his public policy work, Adam has been a highly successful litigator. He also served as a law clerk in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit and in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Adam's political commentary has been published in the National Law Journal, The New Republic, Politico, The Atlantic, U.S. News and World Report, and among other publications. He's also been widely quoted by media from the New York Times and then MSNBC to The Wall Street Journal and Fox <laughs> News. So, Adam. Thank you so much, Donna, and thanks to everybody um, who's taken the time to come out tonight to join us. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, can, is the mic working? Okay, great, terrific. Um, uh, well, again, Donna, thank you very much for the gracious uh, introduction. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I live in New York City now, but I grew up in New Jersey, actually in the shadow of the Fairleigh Dickinson campus, the, the Florham uh, Park branch, not, not this campus. Uh, but so it's great for me to be back in New Jersey and, and to be here at Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, I really feel that it's a tremendous honor to be here to, to speak with all of you tonight and to share the, the stage with these distinguished leaders who are doing so much to confront uh, the issues of gun violence that plague our communities, both here in New Jersey and around the country. Um, I, I really appreciate Fairleigh Dickinson hosting us and want to thank the New, New North Jersey Public Policy Network for organizing this discussion tonight. Uh, I think it's a, a tremendously important issue. Uh, as demonstrated by the interest all of you obviously have. Um, everybody else you're going to hear from tonight is involved in taking action to reduce gun violence across America, uh, and they're pursuing various innovative strategies uh, and, and new approaches, some, some of which have to do with uh, pushing for legislation, many of which do not. Um, and, and it's really inspiring to see the work that they're all doing. In many ways, given the, the very polarized nature of, of the gun debate in our country at this time, um, it's almost necessary to pursue these non-legislative strategies to try and affect uh, change um, because our legislatures are, are so, uh, I'll say, gridlocked. Uh, and that's obviously true of Congress. As we know, not just on this issue, but on every issue, this has been among the least productive Congresses we've had, in, certainly in my memory. Uh, and that's true uh, in state houses around the country as well. Um, and I would point out that the, the lack of progress or the lack of movement uh, on gun legislation in state houses, and, and I should say that there has been uh, a lot of uh, work in states around the country, there have been a lot of uh, really effective bipartisan approaches to this issue uh, where leaders in the states of both political parties have taken really taken the initiative in a way that our Congress has not. Um, but the fact that we're not moving for legislation in Congress and that moving these bills through state legislatures is so challenging is not a product of the fact that there is no legislative solution to some of the issues of gun violence. Indeed, there is. Uh, you know, legislation like background checks on gun sales to ensure that guns are not falling into the hands of dangerous people uh, with violent criminal histories or severe mental illness that makes them a danger to themselves and others. Uh, there is legislation that, that can do that, and since we've required background checks at, at federal gun dealers, uh, they've prevented millions of dangerous prohibited people from acquiring guns. Uh, so there is legislation, um, but it's difficult to move, and even here we are nearly 20 years after 
uh, the, the Brady Act's background checks took effect, uh, and Congress still, even after the tragedy that claimed so many lives in Newtown, Connecticut, Congress still uh, was either unwilling or unable uh, to move to close loopholes in the background check system uh, that allow uh, uh, millions of, uh, of transactions to occur with no background checks at all. Um, so there are obviously high hurdles to moving bills through Congress. Um, and a lot of this resistance comes from a particularly vocal segment of the community that has often taken the position that virtually any restriction or vir virtually any regulation of firearms, excuse me, violates the Second Amendment. And I would say tonight that that's simply not the case. The Second Amendment, as it's been interpreted by the U United States Supreme Court, by the other federal courts across the country, and indeed by legislators and governors and courts throughout the nation's history, uh, has not been seen as an impediment to any regulation of firearms at all. Quite the contrary. In fact, throughout our nation's history, the Second Amendment has been seen as consistent with uh, and permissive of reasonable common sense regulation of firearms to ensure public safety. So that's what I want to focus on tonight. I want to provide a little background information on the Second Amendment, uh, discuss the leeway that it does afford to lawmakers and policymakers to adopt reasonable laws that regulate the ownership and use of firearms, and to sort of put in context uh, the constitutional parameters that guide some of the work that these other uh, leaders are, are doing. So let's let's start with, with the text of the Second Amendment, uh, which I'm sure many in the audience are familiar with. I'll just go ahead and recite it. Uh, the Second Amendment provides a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. It's a lot of commas for less than 30 words. They got four of them in there, and one wonders if the drafters were just kind of getting familiar with this new punctuation. Uh, and, and, and indeed, you know, you could write dissertations on the grammar. I'm sure there probably have been dissertation, PhD dissertations written on the grammar uh, of, of the Second Amendment, but let's, let's move on from that. Uh, you could also write, and indeed there have been dissertations written on the historical meaning of the Second Amendment what it was understood to mean at the time it was adopted, what it has been understood to mean throughout the nation's history. Um, and indeed, these debates about the meaning of the Second Amendment have really heated up in recent years. I, I, I think it's not an exaggeration to suggest that there has been more debate about the meaning of the Second Amendment over the last four decades than probably in the 200 years preceding our, our nation's bicentennial combined. Uh, it has been a, a, a particular area of interest among scholars, among academics, among litigators, and among advocates. Uh, and the meaning and the popular understanding of the meaning of the Second Amendment has, I would submit, evolved in recent years. Uh, and, and that debate culminated in a Supreme Court decision in 2008 called the District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, in which the Supreme Court uh, announced uh, what I think is accurately described as a new view of the meaning of the Second Amendment compared to what courts previously had uh, interpreted it as meaning. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that decision uh, in a moment. What is clear, just to reiterate, about the historical understanding of the Second Amendment is that it has always been seen as permitting uh, a range, a fairly wide range, of regulations of the ownership and use of firearms. Uh, from the very earliest days of the country, uh, the largest colonial cities, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, these uh, cities adopted rules prohibiting the, the discharging of firearms within city limits. They had numerous regulations about storage of gunpowder for fire hazard reasons and so forth. Uh, these regulations were common and they were uncontroversial. <clears throat> Throughout the 19th century, as the country grew and as uh, new cities were incorporated in states around the country, it was uh, routine for state legislatures to vest these cities with the power to adopt uh, gun regulations that were tailored to local conditions, the density of cities, and so forth. Uh, and again, that was uh, relatively uncontroversial. Uh, even in the so-called Wild West that we think of from the movies as being kind of <coughs> gunslingers, gunfights, even within cities in the frontier areas in the Wild West, there was a tremendous amount of regulation uh, of the use and, and uh, of firearms. 
so that cities like Dodge City, which we think of as kind of the archetypical uh, frontier city, Dodge City outlawed carrying concealed weapons within city limits. Similarly, in the late 19th century, if you were out on the, on the range and you were visiting Wichita, Kansas, uh, when you approached city limits, you were asked to check your firearms at the, in effect at the door, at the, at the border of the city, uh, just as you might a coat in a restaurant in, in the winter time, where you check your coat and get a, a ticket that you can later get it back with, uh, when folks uh, who commonly carried uh, firearms in the frontier areas uh, <coughs> approached city limits, they were asked to check their firearms. Uh, so that different rules applied regarding public carrying of guns in cities than did in the uh, less populated rural frontier areas. Um, perhaps the most famous gunfight in all of American history, the shootout at the OK Corral, took place after Wyatt Earp attempted to enforce the Tombstone, Arizona ordinance that prohibited carrying firearms within the city limits of Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, so clearly throughout the Wild West, there was a great deal of regulation. Uh, in, indeed, in the period prior to the Civil War, most states had regulations that either limited public carrying of handguns uh, to all but the, the most uh, unique conditions of, of uh, extreme danger, or prohibited concealed carrying of firearms and knives uh, full stop. And by the second half, after the Civil War, by the second half of the century, almost all states <coughs> prohibited concealed carry outside, again, very limited uh, circumstances, and, and many cities and towns across the country prohibited the carrying of firearms at all. Uh, contrast that to today, uh, where every, all of the 50 states allow uh, the carrying of concealed firearms, and in some cases without a permit at all, in, in the vast majority of states, uh, concealed carry is permitted with a permit. Now, I don't mean to recite this long catalog of historical firearm regulations to uh, say that these were good laws or these were bad laws or to take a position on the merits, uh, but simply to make the point that regulation of firearms was quite widespread, that it was generally uh, uncontroversial, and that pretty much nobody throughout these decades and decades of American history uh, believed that these sorts of uh, public safety laws violated the Second Amendment. Um, I just want to take one more moment to, to give us a, a little bit of flavor of how broad this consensus was uh, in, in favor of the constitutionality of, uh, of uh, firearm regulations. And I want to talk about a law that was called, it was a uniform law, it was something, uh, it's called the Uniform Firearms Act, it was drafted in the early 1920s, uh, proposed uh, as a model that all 50 states could adopt, uh, and indeed uh, adopted in more than a dozen states. Um, and this was seen as a non-controversial, reasonable uh, statute. It was quite long, it had numerous provisions, I'm not gonna recite them all, but I would like to sort of highlight some of the components of this non-controversial bill. Uh, it was among the earlier uh, national model legislation, legislation to forbid people convicted of a crime of violence, that was the term in the statute, from carrying a pistol, from owning a pistol. Uh, it forbids selling a pistol to various folks that were deemed dangerous, people not of sound mind, drug addicts, violent criminals, uh, people under the age of 18, habitual drunkards, that sort of thing. Uh, it forbid carrying a concealed pistol without receiving a license to do that. Uh, it required an applicant for a permit to carry a concealed pistol to apply to local law enforcement to provide a fingerprint, uh, a photograph, basic background information. Uh, you think of that sort of as a background check uh, for carrying a concealed weapon. It created a 48 hour waiting period uh, for pistol purchases to be completed, uh, required extensive record keeping by pistol dealers, and indeed, perhaps most uh, surprisingly given today's environment, it forbid selling pistols by anybody besides a licensed dealer. So in other words, uh, this legislation proposed to eliminate the ability to privately uh, trade uh, or sell firearms amongst unlicensed people. Um, now, there are a lot of people in the country today, including perhaps people in this room today, that would think some or even potentially many of those provisions, 48 hour waiting period, restrictions on private sale, uh, are sweeping, misguided, perhaps extreme. But at the time, uh, that was not the view of this legislation. It's worth noting that this legislation was 
drafted by the president of the National Rifle Association and was touted as a model bill that the National Rifle Association urged states, as I said, across the entire country to adopt. Um, and I, I also think it's telling, uh, the New York State, across the, the river, the New York State legislature, in fact, did uh, adopt this bill. It passed this bill uh, only to have it vetoed uh, in 1932 by uh, Governor, soon to be President, Franklin Rose, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, <coughs> Roosevelt, and this is just months before his campaign for the presidency, uh, you know, about a year before he became president, he vetoed this legislation not because he thought this was too extreme, too restrictive, uh, perhaps unconstitutional. No, Governor at the time, Roosevelt, thought this didn't go far enough. This was not strict enough. And in fact, because it would have repealed New York's even stricter uh, firearms legislation, the Sullivan Act, uh, he vetoed that uh, with its 48-hour waiting periods and so forth. And I think if you just take a moment to think of the politics of that moment, where a 48-hour waiting period bill didn't go far enough, didn't do enough to protect the public safety of the citizens of New York, uh, and that somebody wrote that into the White House, and you think today of the environment that we have in our in our political campaigns, I think it suggests that we're in a very different place. I mean, here you have a leading candidate for the Republican nomination uh, uh, for, for, for the presidency, Scott Walker, who is uh, very publicly supportive of a law that would uh, repeal a 48-hour waiting period in Wisconsin, uh, and I think whether or not he ends up getting the nomination, I think the notion that he would have any chance of getting the Republican nomination for president if he were campaigning saying that a 48-hour waiting period on, on firearm sales was just simply not strict enough, uh, I would be very surprised uh, if that would be a winning plan, uh, plank in a platform for the Republican presidential nomination. So that's the historical backdrop uh, that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I mentioned earlier that in 2008, the Supreme Court issued a decision, the Heller case, uh, in which it recognized for the first time uh, that the core uh, of the Second Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, uh, was the right of lawful law-abiding uh, Americans to use firearms for self-defense, in that case, in the home. Uh, and this was a major departure, whether or not people think Heller was correctly decided, I think it is, it's beyond dispute that Heller was a major departure from what the courts had previously seen the Second Amendment as, as meaning. I, I don't want to get into, I've already talked too long, I don't want to get into a longer discussion uh, about Heller. Um, I would suggest that if folks are interested in the sort of campaign to have the court adopt this new, different view of uh, the Second Amendment as not having really anything do with uh, possessing or bearing, keeping your bearing arms in the context of, of state militia service. Uh, there are a couple of books that I would, I would recommend. One is called Gunfight by Professor Adam Winkler, uh, who's out in California. Uh, the second one, which just came out uh, within the past year or so, is a book called The Second Amendment a Biography uh, by a former boss of mine at the Brennan Center, Michael Walton. Both of those books go through uh, uh, a discussion of how the Second Amendment uh, so Heller was a, a major change in the Second Amendment law or jurisprudence, but I, I think it's important to note Heller explicitly said in that decision that the right in the Second Amendment, the right to keep and carry arms, was not, and I'm quoting here, was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever purpose. And Heller expressly said that long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, like schools and government buildings, the laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of, of arms uh, didn't violate the Second Amendment. So the Supreme Court in Heller, uh, as was consistent historically, understood that whatever the right uh, protected by the Second Amendment, it was not an absolute right and it did not prohibit reasonable regulations. And indeed, after Heller, uh, courts hearing Second Amendment challenges to firearm laws have upheld those laws about 90% of the time. Um, um, that's not certainly to say that anything goes and the Second Amendment has no meaning. That's, that would be completely inaccurate. If New Jersey tomorrow passed a law that said nobody could ever use a rifle for, for lawful hunting or nobody could ever use under any circumstances uh, a handgun for self-defense, that law would be patently unconstitutional and be struck down. Uh, but if the New Jersey legislature
legislature decided to pass a bill uh, that would, for instance, prohibit domestic abusers uh, from, from uh, convicted domestic abusers from possessing guns or requiring them to, sur uh, to surrender firearms when they became prohibited or required uh, universal background checks on all gun sales, those plainly would uh, pass muster under the Second Amendment. So the last concluding thought I want to share, it's not the Constitution that prevents our legislatures in our states and in Congress from passing common sense gun laws. Uh, it, it's not the Constitution, it, if anything, is the political environment. And ultimately, passing effective gun laws that will protect our communities and ensure public safety may require changing the overall <coughs> culture and changing the political culture uh, from what we have today. In the meantime, with this sort of comprehensive legislation uh, not moving forward, uh, addressing issues of gun violence may require taking some innovative uh, and, and interesting new strategies. Uh, and it's a real honor for me to be sitting here on stage with folks that are doing just that. So I think uh, with that, uh, and with no further ado, I should uh, pass the... Uh, Thank you, Adam. I agree. Rabbi, can, can we uh, point out uh, omissions or errors in the discussion? You, uh, after, we will have a opportunity. Because obviously I'm a New Jersey lawyer, he's not familiar with the New Jersey laws. As soon as we right. introduce all the panelists. December 16th in the presence of President Obama in Newtown, Connecticut to intone the Hebrew memorial prayer, God full of compassion. That prayer was for the 26 innocent lives lost that day in Sandy Hook, as well as for all the lives lost daily to gun violence, particularly children in our inner cities. Together with his friends and colleagues, Rabbi Praver stands at the epicenter of the Newtown Effect. He effectively advocated before the Connecticut and Washington DC lawmakers for sensible gun laws and mental health services. On behalf of Newtown, Rabbi Praver asks of us tonight and always to behave in a culture of peace and civility. Thank you for being here tonight, Rabbi. We have 15 minutes. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> and thank you, Rhoda, for inviting me to this evening for this wonderful evening uh, discussion. It was Friday morning. It was December 14th. I had a bat mitzvah lesson the very talented student. She was taking the morning off to rehearse for her bat mitzvah, which would be the very next day. Her father, a fireman, came in. It was a 10 o'clock appointment. He walked in to the synagogue at 10.02 and called me aside to talk with me. I noticed from this very tall, six foot four uh, linebacker he played one in, in high school, a little tear come to the side of his eye. And he said, Rabbi, I'm gonna probably be called away from our rehearsal because there's been a shooting, a shooting. What do you mean? And he said, at one of the schools. And so the psychological process that goes on in many people's minds is to minimize tragedy at first, and there certainly is no reason to think that there was something going on that we know took place now. And so, in my mind, I figured, well, some student came into the school, you know, with, with a gun, their father's gun to show their friends or something, and they got um, called to the side, and, and, the, and there was a big scene about that. And so, he, well, he went because he did get called, and I tried to kind of go along things, along things in a uh, normal way and continue with my rehearsal. I have to produce a bat mitzvah girl for the next day. And so I tried to uh, do that. Uh, but the bat mitzvah girl was in the synagogue looking at the, the near tummy, the eternal light, really spaced out. 
And um, I guess she knew, in retrospect, from her father, or he might have um, told her a little bit more than he told me, that this was different. This one was different. And, uh, and the mother also was uh, quite, quite uh, upset and, and shocked. And then very quickly, the uh, text messages came in that there was a teacher that got shot in the foot and the principal um, and uh, psychologist were uh, slaughtered in the office. They were killed in, in the office. And, and so, you, again, you say, okay, that's a terrible thing, a terrible, terrible tragedy, and you want to <coughs> contain it, you know, as that's all, that's all there is to that tragedy. And then, even to the point where the phone rang from Monsignor Weiss's uh, secretary calling all of the clergy down, um, and to the point that I was running into the firehouse and seeing helicopters and every single news media, you know, flooding in the streets, <coughs> you always think that maybe that, that's all there is to it, you know, just these two murders. Um, I walk into the first area where the trucks are dispatched, the fire trucks, and there's teachers there, there are FBI people all over the place, uh, and they're taking down narratives, they're talking to the teachers, the, uh, they're being instructed to put an X by a uh, person's name that was absent, to put a check by a student's name that they know was present and they know left the building. And then a zero next to uh, a person that they know was present, but they don't know for sure you know, where their whereabouts and they didn't see them uh, walking out the building. And uh, th this is the kind of thing that FBI does when they come to these kinds of tragedies. Um, and then before you know it, there's like a shrill in the room and, and the teachers are saying, you know, not Vicky, not Vicky, not Vicky. And that was when they learned that the substitute teacher um, in her classroom w was um, killed. Um, and I uh, actually was in the firehouse and didn't know the number of, of casualties, fatalities, uh, until I, I picked up the telephone and ABC flashed on and I, I saw it. And uh, then I knew we were in big trouble. I just wanted to give you a little bit of the uh, events of that morning and let you know how it's changed me and what I want to do about it today. So, uh, first of all, my whole life turned, uh, changed completely. Today I am a prison chaplain serving 18, potentially 19 of the facilities, correctional facilities in the state of Connecticut and I am very compelled, very interested in, in getting to know and understand the uh, people that perpetuate violent crimes. I want, to I want to look at them in the eye and I want to understand, I want to understand this. I have a, a very strong desire to have uh, intimate knowledge of the mindset and the mentality that enables people to do these acts of violence, most of which are not in a spree shooting, but one, two, three, four, here and there. In the United States, well, let me put it this way, in the world, 86% of all civilian fatalities as a result of firearms occur in the United States. Now, I started out a certain way in advocacy, and I've come to a, a little different place today. I believe that, and Adam just touched this before, he used the word changing the culture, he spoke about polarization, and he spoke about uh, the, an impasse of not being able to communicate and not being able to make any headway uh, socially, culturally, and politically. And so I know that we can make progress in areas that are already receptive 
to gun regulation. I know we can do it here. I know we did it in Connecticut, in New York, in Maryland, California, and uh, different places. But I am very skeptical at this point if any significant progress can be made unless we have the civil dialogue. And that means taking seriously the concerns of our interlocutors at the table. And uh, so let me cut through the chase because uh, a lot of people will not necessarily always uh, admit this, but I think at the core of our differences is the idea that the Second Amendment is to assuage the tyranny of, of government, that there is this driving desire to empower the people uh, so that the government feels uh, that they have some kind of check to their power. And this is the way uh, many conservative people look at the situation. And those concerns are not going to go away by just saying, come on. They're not going to go away by just saying, that's ridiculous. <coughs> we have to leave a seat at the table to people that have that opinion. And we need to let them know that we know they have an equal concern for safety and the protection of life. With that kind of respect and dignity that we give to people that we don't agree with, then we can build trust. I, one of the people that I, you know, I don't agree with everything that goes on, obviously, uh, with my camp, which is the regulation camp. And I heard one person say the other day, we went to the rally and we outshouted the NRA. And I was like, but did you talk to them? <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's the problem. You, you, you turn on the television and people are, are shouting at each other. And we have not had the nuanced conversation about guns in America. I have tried out my, my uh, civility approach, and I know that it works. And I have actually a book that's coming out called Sacred Testimony, and a large part of the book contains the dialogue that I had with an oath keeper, which is, I would say, you know, a very, very, uh, very, very intense advocate for gun rights, the oath keepers. And uh, we had this conversation, and there are many things that we agreed on. I'm going down to Washington, D.C. in mid-April to speak with a uh, member of the clergy, uh, evangelical member of the clergy. And uh, this individual <coughs> is open to a conversation about how we can protect lives, you know, as a, as a Christian individual, and me as the rabbi, how, you know, coming from a liberal place versus a very conservative place, how we can come together, because we all agree, and we all want to feel safe when we put our children on that yellow school bus, and we all cry, and it hurts every one of us when these things happen. But you see, when we start the conversation with you don't really care about the, the death of, of, of people that die from guns, that's not really a way to make friends and influence people. So we need to uh, use, use these tools. Now this, I, another individual here was present when I spoke in Great Neck, and the Oath Keepers were there. And uh, it was quite an e evening. And uh, in the beginning, they called me Nazi, CIA, agent, all these nasty words. And then when we um, talked, you know, they said, well, we made an oath. I said, well, I made an oath too, you know? I made an oath to the Connecticut Constitution, you know, as a chaplain, okay? So you're not the only one that makes oaths. And, you know, so we, we had a friend, we had it out. We both said what we had to say. 
But in the end, they said, well, you know, the rabbi's a nice guy. Uh, he's a little confused, but he's all right. And so we went from Nazi to uh, he's all right because of civil dialogue. I had a, uh, an inmate accost me, and he uh, pulled my hand to his heart and held me there. And at first, I was, I was fresh out of the academy, and I was thinking, you know, what am I going to do to him, you know? How am I going to get him, you know, to leave me alone? But then I remembered the uh, interpersonal communication skill is your first weapon, your first tool. And so there I was with my hand on his heart, and I took it to him, and I said, oh, you have a beautiful heart, my friend. He looked at me, he was like, yo, Rabbi, we, you cool, we cool. <laughs> and he let me go. So, my friends, if I could do that with a killer, and he was, I looked up his background afterwards. <laughs> we could do it with people that are upstanding members of our country that happen to be conservative and happen to be NRA members. And not, nothing is gonna happen, nothing big is gonna happen until we do. And that's why uh, my organization Global Coalition for Peace and Civility, our first step out of the corral will be uh, civil dialogue and seeing where, you know, where we agree. And I'll tell you one little secret, that when you concede points to the person you are speaking with, you win more, a lot more. And so first go to the things that you can agree about, because underneath it all is they think that you're a gun grabber and, and if you are, it's not going to go anywhere. You, you have to first uh, build some trust and go into the harder places, okay? Go into these, pla uh, you know, rural America and have the conversation. And don't assume that they don't love their children as much as liberals love their children, because you won't get to first base uh, that way. So uh, I, I'm very happy and thankful to be here to be able to uh, share these remarks with you this evening. So long, please. So I grew up in Louisiana, and my NRA friends in Louisiana all believe in background checks, and I was quite proud of my state that uh, passed uh, sweeping legislation to keep guns out of domestic abusers, and it was proposed by two New Orleans-based legislatures and signed by Governor Dindell and passed unanimously. And it was also um, passed, obviously, by the, um, the uh, legislators who proposed the constitutional amendment, which passed unanimously, making guns a fundamental right in Louisiana. Those legislators had said they never meant for those, that, that amendment to, that meant a domestic abusers should have guns. So you know, people really can't agree when they sit down and they talk. So thank you for making that point. Our next panelist, Mandy Perlmutter. She is a lawyer, she is a wife, she's the mother of three small children, and in her spare time, Mandy has volunteered for numerous organizations dedicated to improving the lives of women, children, and families. Man Mandy held two leadership positions uh, in the New Jersey chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. She actually founded that chapter right after the horrific massacre at Sandy Hook. She also has served as that organization's advocacy lead to promote sensible gun laws to protect children and families. And uh, Mandy now describes herself as just a volunteer with the organization, but because I've just been a volunteer for 15 years, I know there's no such thing as just a volunteer. So thank you, Mandy. that we can use a common sense perspective to get there. 
So I'm going to go through some of what's going on in New Jersey, um, talk a little bit about what our organization focuses on, and also talk a little bit about some myths that we hear a lot in this work, and um, then we can get started. So I think that everyone in the room is probably pretty familiar. If you're here, you're paying attention, and you know that we have a big problem with gun violence in this country. Um, one statistic that stands out for me is that there were 30, almost 34,000 motor vehicle deaths um, and almost as many in 2013 uh, firearm deaths. This year, that's likely to flip-flop and we're going to see more gun deaths and motor vehicle deaths. Um, a statistic that's particularly meaningful to me is that there are more than 100,000 people who are shot a year. Uh, we often think in terms of gun deaths, um, but every time there's gun violence in a the community, their ripple effects are tremendous. Um, and after... We're not going to answer questions right now. We're going to take the questions after, and we're going to be very civil. You'll get your chance. Uh, so, obviously, this, this chart is pretty, uh, you know, demonstrates what we all know. The U.S. rate of homicide by firearms is nearly 20 times higher than the average high-income country. So, if we're talking about New Jersey, New Jersey is ranked as having the fourth strongest gun laws in the country and the fifth lowest rates of gun violence. That's a... Um, uh, comparison we often see. States with better gun laws have lower rates of gun violence. Um, New Jersey generally prohibits the knowing possession of a handgun in any place other than one's own property or place of business without a permit to carry a handgun. Um, some examples of some of the laws we have that a permit is required to purchase a handgun. We have a 15 round magazine limit. Um, some states have, have 10 round limits. We have a 15 round limit. Um, we have a, a one handgun a month law that you're only able to purchase one handgun a month. Um, we have a, um, a childproof handgun law, which is not yet really in effect, but once the technology is marketable for childproof uh, handguns, um, they will be required on handgun sales within three years. So um, obviously in the next couple of years, that will be, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. Um, we don't really have open carry, and we have strictly limited concealed carry. We are considered a May issue state. So if New Jersey, so New Jersey has New Jersey has decent gun laws. So why is New Jersey an important state to be focusing on? New Jersey is the leading importer of illegal crime guns in the country. So we have strong gun laws, but we're being affected by other states' weak laws and loopholes in the federal system. Um, about 80% of the guns used in crimes in New Jersey come from other states through what we often call the Iron Pipeline. The Carolinas, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh, New Jersey is actually the third lowest exporter of crime guns in the country. They don't, crime guns don't often originate in New Jersey. Um, so this is, we think that New Jersey is a really important place to be having this conversation because we're being affected by, by what's going on elsewhere. And it's also important because New Jersey has long been a leader in gun safety legislation, and it's really important that we stay at the forefront. So we do have a couple of bills pending. Um, that We have a background check bill that would require those who want to buy a shotgun or rifle to first complete a background check at the point of sale for private sales. We also have a, um, a bill with respect to guns and domestic violence. Um, you can see what some of the details are. There's also a, um, a child access prevention uh, bill that's pending. It would upgrade the penalties for adults who leave loaded weapons in places where children can access them. Um, this bill passed the Senate, but it's, it's somewhat stalled in the Assembly. Right now, it's a disorderly person's offense. Okay, so something we talk about a lot in our organization is access. And uh, we, uh, we know that more than 2 million children live in homes with unsecured guns. And already this year, I'm sure if you've been following the news, we've had a number of incidents involving very small children. And uh, what we like to say is that those are not accidents. Those are acts of negligence. They should be treated as such. And often in the media, uh, they are called accidents. And some statistics related to child access, that 70% of unintentional shootings could have been prevented if the firearm had been stored and locked, stored locked and unloaded. 40% of unintentional shootings take place, deaths take place in the room where the gun is stored. So what can we do? This is something we focus on 
a, a significant amount of our efforts. Um, we seek to encourage responsible gun ownership and a culture of respectful gun ownership. That with those Second Amendment rights that Adam described to us, we also have responsibilities. And so we want people talking about guns in the home. We want parents talking about when they're sending their child out to play, talking about whether their child could be in the presence of an unlocked and unstored firearm. Um, we also want gun owners to be held accountable for negligence and not to treat these incidents as accidents. And something that's particularly frustrating to me is when we talk about teaching children not to touch firearms. Um, I, the, the burden should not be on the children not to touch. I have two sons who are 11 and 4, and if I tell them not to touch something, I can guarantee they're going to touch it. The burden really should be on the, on the adults. And um, I know that the NRA does focus on safety training, but they do talk a lot about children not teaching children not to touch firearms and to respect firearms, and, and that burden really needs to be on the adults. So another issue we focus a significant amount of effort on is suicide. We don't talk enough about suicide and firearms and the connection, and it's quite a toxic connection. More than 50% of all suicides involve guns, and few suicide attempters would survive a, a gunshot. Um, suicide rates are lower in states with lower rates of gun ownership and higher in states with higher rates of gun ownership. And again, I'm sort of a broken record on this, it's access. Um, a recent study found that 82% of guns used in suicide belong to a family member. So talking about access, making sure that our, that our guns are properly secured is, is critical. So school shootings, I know it, it, we have talked a lot about them, but I think a, a really important statistic to keep in mind is that nearly two-thirds of guns used in school shootings were acquired in the shooter's home. Again, it's access. Um, and just as a parent, something that, um, you know, that I think about a lot is that we've increased the number of lockdown drills, active shooter drills, we've improved security in our schools, but we really haven't done much to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And I know that when my children go to school, um, I know for my son, he, we pull up to school and some days there's a police officer sitting at, at security, and this is only since Newtown that, that we have this, and my son doesn't feel safer. He'll say, Mom, why is there a police officer at my school? What's gonna happen at my school? So to make, we're not making our children feel very safe by teaching them to hide under desks while, while it is a necessary evil at this, at this time. So something I'm sure you've been following in the news is the, um, this is just more of a, a general movement around the country to allow guns on college campuses to prevent mass shooting, sexual assault, crime on campus. Um, you probably saw this, heard this quote by Nevada Assemblywoman. Um, if these young, hot little girls on campus have a firearm, I wonder how many men will want to assault them. The sexual assaults that are occurring would go down once these sexual predators get a bullet in their head. So that's, that's a lot of what we're hearing. Um, but unfortunately, we know that more guns equal more crime. Um, and, we, and putting guns on college campus would, would be quite detrimental. Um, we know that states with open and concealed carry, or you know, a, a lot of um, concealed carry holders, there, there's going to be greater levels of gun violence. And we're also adding guns to college campuses and potentially arming more more predators. So um, it's it, you know we should all be paying attention. If any of us have children going to college, it's certainly something. What what type of culture do we want our our teens moving to and, and living? some of the statistics related to how people feel about guns on campus. I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths that we hear a lot um, as we're traveling around the state and talking to people, um, as we're writing letters to the editor, we're, we're hearing a lot of this, the similar arguments. And one is that it's a mental health issue and it's not about the guns. Um, but we know that only four to five percent of all gun violence is related to mental health issues. And a mental health issue is more likely to result in a suicide rather than mass gun violence. Um, again, it's an issue of access. I am a broken record on this, I know. Um, there is interesting new legislation called a Gun Violence Prevention Restraining Order. It has been signed into law in California, and it would allow families to petition the courts to have guns removed where they believe that a family member could hurt themselves or others. So it's interesting, I think, um, We'll see what happens. The bill has been introduced in New Jersey, but it hasn't moved. We hear this a lot, and our society is a polite society. Um, we don't really have statistics to back that up. So uh, we know that guns are rarely used in self-defense, and that the presence of a gun may actually increase risk. 
we hear this a lot in New Jersey because we have so many guns coming in illegally. Um, we need to enforce the laws we already have before enacting new ones. Um, we have awesome law enforcement in New Jersey. We, our, our U.S. attorney is there every day. You could read stories of gun traffickers being um, being prosecuted, and. Uh, in New Jersey especially, they're working hard, but it's really hard to, to stop the flow of guns. Um, the poli former police director of New York, Samuel DeMeo, spoke out very vocally on this issue when he was, had hit that position. Um, one quote, we recovered 786 guns in Newark last year. Do you know how many of them were purchased in Newark at zero? So it's, it's hard for law enforcement to do their job. So we often hear the myth that guns make us safer, but if that were true, we would be, we would have the safest country in the world. You can see that the rates of gun ownership, as those rates go up, the rate of gun deaths go up as well. That guns protect women from sexual assault, from sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, but we know that uh, women with access to firearms become homicide victims at significantly higher rates than men. And women are five times as likely to be killed by an intimate partner when a firearm is present. Um, and again, as I said, with respect to children, the burden being on children, it also, this also places the onus on women to protect themselves and not really deal with the issue of sexual assault in our society. Um, one example I like to give, you probably remember about two, year, about two years ago, there was an incident in Milburn. And there was Shut up! There was a home invasion in Milburn, and a woman was sitting on the couch watching television with her child. You can let me finish. Not civil please, please, please stop her from lying. She's not lying. Do you think you have a chance to say that? Can you bring the to this? Okay, uh, sir. Can you let the rabbi speak for a second? You, you have a chance to say all that. Okay? Just if you think she's lying. so many lies. I'm always supposed to keep track of them all. Take notes. Take notes. And make your point. Let me judge in two minutes. What? what two minutes. Is that a better idea? Excellent. So there, uh, so there was this home invasion in Melbourne, and a woman was sitting on the couch watching TV with, I think, her four-year-old, and somebody broke into her house and assaulted her. There was not a firearm involved. And what we heard from people who would, would support um, you know, more open uh, concealed carry and uh, more access to firearms is that had she had a firearm, she would have been able to protect herself. But my issue with it is that that assumes that she's sitting on the couch with a loaded firearm ready to shoot, because how else would she be in a position to defend herself with a firearm with someone coming, coming, approaching her? So what can you do if this is an issue that you want to get involved in and you want to add your voice? Uh, we know that the gun lobby is calling and, and uh, making their voices heard, and we should be too. So um, I can help you find your state legislators, or you can certainly go online. Um, we talked about the, the bills that are pending, and our legislators should hear from you that those are bills that you want to support and you want them to support. What else can you do? Probably a lot of people in this room live in Congressman Garrett's district. Um, he needs to hear from, from his constituents who would support common sense gun safety measures like expanded background checks. There is a new bill pending in the House and that he should not support concealed carry reciprocity, which is also uh, a, a bill pending at this time. So we also, because we're focused so much on responsible gun ownership, respecting the right of gun owners, but also encouraging responsibility, um, let's get talking about it. And that we should engage law enforcement in the conversation. We do have really great law enforcement in New Jersey that wants to make things better. Um, we always encourage writing letters to the editor and utilizing social media as a platform. A lot of this dialogue is taking place on social media and it's a good place to engage. Um, there's an event coming up I just wanted to tell you about. On uh, March 29th, 26 cyclists will be passing through New Jersey on their way from Connecticut to DC. It's a really motivating and inspiring event. And I would encourage you all to come out. I have some flyers if you're, there's some flyers in the front if you're interested in learning more about it. Thank you, Nancy.
would have um, introduced me, and I, I'm not doing this to embarrass you, but I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, I actually never worked in the White House. The National Rifle Association said I worked in the White House. So my Louisiana friends in the NRA started calling me and asking me could I get White House tour tickets for them. I'm like, I, I don't work in the White House. I've never worked in the White House, but I, it makes me sound more important, so I don't really mind it. But again, there's a lot of disinformation that goes around, uh, and I, I, I just felt that I needed to correct that, so thank you. Now, the mayor. Mayor of New Jersey since 2013. Before becoming mayor, Mayor Bullock, he served as a councilman for eight years. He has a master's degree in business administration, has worked in finance, and has served his country as a United States Marine in Iraq. Thank you for that. Um, Todd, as, among others, as a rising political star in New Jersey. He's a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, and he's often, often cited as a prime example of how progressive leadership works. Some of the issues and initiatives he's addressed during his first year in office, including getting illegal guns off New Jersey streets. So thank you for being here, Mayor. The, uh, the, let me start by saying thank you all for coming here tonight. The, uh, and in the introduction for the rabbi earlier, I mentioned to him um, part of his bio was he became an accidental advocate and uh, accidental activist. And uh, I mentioned to him when he said it that I feel sometimes like I'm an accidental mayor in some ways. And uh, I'll explain to you why um, I feel that way. But uh, there's certainly not going to be a 15 minute conversation here because I know that a lot of people do want to get into a conversation and a dialogue. And, and during my um, a, a little levity here uh, to change the course of the conversation a little bit, during my college years, I spent some time at Oxford University. And uh, one thing great about Oxford University is that they have rooms like this that it's not regular that people learn in this environment. It's usually one-to-one -one teacher to student ratio. And uh, several times during the semester, they bring in famous actors and athletes and politicians. And they bring in all the 35 different colleges into a learning environment. And it's an aggressive dialogue. Not dissimilar to what you just saw over here, as a matter of fact. And uh, when I was there, I had the opportunity to see uh, former Secretary of State James Baker speak. And the normal dialogue from one of these things at Oxford is a, uh, it's a five to six minute presentation, not even 15 minutes, and then they get into a aggressive Q&A, which I could see some of you are ready to go at. And uh, when I was there, James Baker spoke for a little bit more than an hour and five minutes of his portion. <laughs> and somebody in the front row actually started to get up and rustle around and put their hat on and, and their jacket. And uh, James Baker actually stopped his presentation and said, uh, excuse me, you're being extremely disruptive. Uh, what could possibly be so important? And uh, James Baker is, called him out in the, middle of the in the middle of the auditorium. And the student looked up and said, look, I need to leave. I apologize. I need to go get a haircut. And uh, James Baker said, um, paused, and then he said, listen, I'm a little older than everybody in this room. You're all students, um, so I don't, I don't feel bad about this. I think it's a good lesson. He said, uh, if you need to get a haircut, uh, the right thing to do is to uh, do it before or after so you're not so disruptive when people are speaking. Does that make sense? And the student, without missing a beat, said it does. <coughs> when this started, I didn't need a haircut. And I tell him to change so, so I, I assure you we're not going to go that far as it relates to uh, my conversations here. But um, I, I do want to take a second and talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening in Jersey City. And uh, you know, my background is, uh, in some ways, I do believe that I'm an accidental mayor in the sense that I only got involved in government or politics uh, fairly late relatively to some of my peers. I registered to vote uh, when I was, I believe, 27 years old. Um, I left the job at Goldman Sachs. It was my first job out of college. Um, I was working there for two years, inspired by what happened uh, subsequent to 9-11, and uh, decided to enlist in the Marine Corps. And uh, you can imagine my parents' uh, feeling on that. They have a deli in Newark. They're still there every single day. And uh, when I made the decision to leave, and uh, when you talk about some of the firearms that are discussed today, for example, the one that was used in Newtown, the AR-15, um, it's a very similar weapon to what were issued in the Marine Corps. It's a very similar weapon to the M-16. The only difference is one feature. It's a first feature. So I'm more than familiar with how these things are made and what their intended uses are, as many of you are here in this room. You know, I won an upset election two years ago. 
virtually everybody in the infrastructure was on the other side. And I'm thankful for that in hindsight, although it was stressful, because it's given me a great deal of flexibility to look at things in a different way without kind of special interest pushing you in one direction or another direction. And uh, I think we've tried to do that in Jersey City. When you look at this conversation about gun reform and gun advocacy, it really, at the end of the day, comes down to money. If you look at the disproportionate amount of spending between the gun reform and the gun pro-gun advocates on the NRA side, it is more than 10 to 1. And that's the reason why when you have something like Newtown or Columbine, going back further, you will see it repeat again and again, despite the fact that basic things like background checks that Mandy touched on get shouted down and have approval or support from polling of 90% of the public. Think about that for a second. What in this country has approval and support by 90% of the nothing, people? Not nothing. That. But yet, at the same time, nothing gets done legislatively. In the days that followed Newtown, the New York Times wrote about this extensively, hundreds, hundreds of bills were proposed literally all over the country as it relates to gun reform and pro-gun. If you look at who was winning that dialogue, disproportionately was pro-gun. The, the laws actually became more easy and more accessible as opposed to more stringent, despite the tone. You had legislators in Colorado that were for pro-gun reform, and the end result of that was that they were recalled. So when you think about the dialogue, what's happening, it is really, really a horrible thing on so many fronts. Because if you think about it, I don't think anybody up here is really saying it is an absolute terms. You're either for gun, guns absolutely or against guns absolutely. But to sit here and say that you shout down Mandy or shout down somebody because they're advocating for simple common sense reforms that some down. of them, but one second, lying. sir, sir, I'm not, I did, wasn't disrespectful for you. Yeah, they asked the same. Listen, listen. So the fact that, that you take this tone when somebody says a little bit about changing the dialogue today in a reasonable way, you cannot argue that when you look at the statistics, that we have a problem in this country. Now, why you have a problem, we can discuss that, but it is very clear that the numbers point to what's happening here is disproportionately larger than every developed country in the world. That's a fact. That is an absolute fact. If you look at the numbers of guns available in this country today, they actually outnumber the population. It's a fact. There is no other country in the world that has that. So when somebody starts in the dialogue saying, hey, let's talk about what to change, what to improve, it's not something wrong to have. It's not an absolute conversation to be shouting somebody down. It's a conversation that can be productive when you, it's not lying. Those are facts that I just said. No, it's not. It's not a fact that the In Jersey City, in Jersey City, in Jersey City, we are taking the approach of saying that there is a possibility to change things actually at the local level. Now, if you look at what's happening, if, listen, if you look at, if you look at, if you look at what's happening, if you look at what's happening at the national level, I think we'll certainly understand the fact that, uh, if you look at what's happening at the national level, I think you'll certainly understand the fact that despite public approval, despite polling, you will see in Washington and Trenton very little progress. And the reason is very clear. As I said earlier, it's nothing other than money is the reason for that. Now, when you think, these are, when, when you think about what we've tried to do at the local level, is we've worked with we've worked with advocacy groups, and we've taken the approach of saying we've taken the simple approach that, of saying that how can a local municipality how can a local municipality change the dialogue? And it's possible because when you look at who are the biggest purchasers of guns or ammunitions outside of the United States military, it is police departments across this country. A city like Jersey City. City like Jersey City spends per year several hundred thousand dollars on ammunitions and firearms. A city like New York City spends several millions of dollars. We started in Jersey City working with advocacy. It's a simple experiment to say that if the premise that this country is built on as it relates to capitalism, can that drive the dialogue to some degree in creating change? And what we did was we said, let's ask a simple questionnaire. Let's engage the people who are buying the, the ammunition and guns from Jersey City to ask them how they feel about certain common sense reforms, background checks. Would they honor certain things about reselling firearms once they purchase ours back from Jersey City about restrictions on where they would sell them? How do they feel about uh, assault ref rifles? How do they feel about guns and video games for children? Simple, simple things. The first time that we put that out, the NRA went crazy, and Scott Bach, who was a national board member of the NRA in New Jersey, 
he said that I should know better. This is the approach. It's, no, it's not dissimilar to the dialogue that you hear in this room of people yelling. He said that I should know better as the grandson of Holocaust survivors had my grandparents had guns, perhaps the outcome would have been different. There are few things in my 38 years of life, I'm much younger than a lot of people here, that I've heard as idiotic as that, okay? Now I tell you, I tell you because you don't grasp the history of the Holocaust or genocides if you are equating that somebody would have had a gun, a rifle, that they would have changed the dynamic here. There's one thing for certain that I do know about that that if my grandparents had a gun when the Nazis came to take them, I surely would not be sitting here today. This I know, okay? Now I say today that when we put out that RFP, the first time somebody responded, nobody responded because of the NRA, and the second time we saw one responder, and then once one responder engaged, two responders engaged because they wanted the business. And what we learned from that is that you can shape the dialogue based on how cities use their purchasing ability. It's something Seattle's looking at today, it's something Chicago's looking at today, it's other cities around New Jersey. Now Jersey City's not gonna shape the gun dialogue by itself. Let's not be naive to that. A couple hundred thousand dollars isn't gonna shape the entire dialogue. But there is the window that we saw for the first time of actually saying that we can have an impact. You can aggregate that and you can have an impact. Imagine what would happen if New York City used that. 30,000 police officers, it's virtually an army in some way going out every single year thinking about how they purchase and where they purchase from. Do you think that their vendors would think about what can I do in order to make sure I secure that, that, that business from New York City? <coughs> and I assure you, there's nothing absolute. Nobody in this room is saying that it's 100% in one direction. It's about a dialogue. And so with that, I think that in Jersey City, we are a model for what is possible because a lot of this stuff at the end of the day is common sense. It's really common sense that I think most of you in this room certainly know, and I know that 90% of the public actually knows. So with that, I say, on a night like tonight, I get a briefing before I come out every single day, and they will say to me um, what I'm doing. And with this one, they said that you're speaking head to head with the NCAA first round tournament, so be brief, <laughs> all right? Thank you all. Thank you. There actually was a poll done, and uh, you were a little incorrect. You said that nothing was more popular. Ice cream polled higher than background checks, but kittens and baseball did not. So more Americans polled believe that we need background checks, and they lo the love of kittens or baseball. So thank you very much. Now we will, you know, if, if, if any of the panelists have a question for uh, each other before we open it up, go for it. Or yeah, sure. Question over here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm assigned. Yes. No, no, no. I, uh, it's a great question. Let's just, right question. question. The, 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 re, the, the question. The question was. The, the, the question is. The question is. Do I travel with armed security, and are they here with me tonight? By Jersey City law, for decades and decades, there is a police officer assigned to whoever the mayor is, 24 hours a day. It's consistent with everyone across the country. And why is that? Okay, is the premise. It's not, it's not a risk, you're asking a question. It's not because somebody, the concern about necessarily somebody in this room about accosting me per se, but you know what the citizens of Jersey City said at some point when you are in a crowded situation and sometimes people have polarized views as they do today, there could be a risk for somebody. So they do. my security detail and where they're assigned to me and when they are assigned to me and, and you will tell well this is by Jersey City law and you will tell me the lion's share of the time I opt not to have them whenever feasibly possible and I don't control them ultimately I opt not to have them why because I don't really feel it necessary now some people would say that's stupid on my part but that's the way I've approached it for the last two years I mean it is what it is you will not see an advanced detail for me. You will not see a post detail for me. I don't have any of that stuff. The answer is no. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So we have a question. Oh, if we can ask people to line up and answer um, questions, do you mind coming up here? Since we need we need the recording to be able to hear the question so the speakers yes, sure. don't have to repeat. If you have a question, please line up. Thank you. If you just if you want to say your name and where you're from, that's fine. If not, but, and and if you can address it to one panelist in particular or if it's a general question, just say it's a general question. George Hertzberg from Norwood. I, uh, I remember listening to my grandfather listening on the radio during World War II and listening and, and getting angrier and angrier knowing that his cousins were being killed. Uh, my mother and I lived with my grandparents at the time. I served uh, in the Army also uh, in, uh, and when I got out in 1959, I had a both a marksman and a sharpshooter's accomplishment, and I became a hunter not long after that, and have shot hunted ducks with shotguns and hunted with rifles. Uh, I don't, I don't consider it particularly sporting to hunt a larger game with more than a few rounds able to shoot that game, and if I'm not able to do so, then I, I have not been able to do so. I understand that there are many people who believe that it is important to hunt with large numbers of, of possible rounds. I happen to disagree with that. But more importantly, my question to anybody and everybody on the panel is, uh, what can we do to make sure that we have adequate mental health control in this country to be able to assure that that bad guy never has the gun. What can we do to make sure that we have an adequate mental health system in every single state? I consider there were 28 victims at Sandy Hook, the shooter and his mother, along with the rest of the shooter's victims. Thank you. I'll just uh, offer one response. Uh, thank you uh, for your service and thank you for, for the question. Um, you know, our background check system has uh, prevented, as I said earlier, more than two million uh, prohibited persons from acquiring uh, firearms from licensed dealers since its inception. Uh, that said, the background check system is only so good as the records that it contains, and unfortunately, uh, in part because of bureaucratic uh, inertia, in part because of misunderstandings about the medical privacy laws, there are, pardon me, there, there are many states that have not submitted adequate, uh, adequately submitted their mental health records into the background check system. So I think one thing we can do is support those states uh, closing those gaps and ensuring that when a person is uh, committed involuntarily because the judge uh, has determined that they pose a danger to themselves or to others, that those records get in and prevent them from, from uh, getting firearms. You know, mental health uh, is, is a difficult issue. Uh, I think Mandy earlier mentioned uh, legislation to propose orders that would allow family members when they see red flag signs of distress and danger for a family member to present that evidence to a court to temporarily suspend that person's access to firearms. You know, there are some legislative you know, solutions that are worth looking at. Uh, but I think ultimately, you know, we need, uh, ultimately we need uh, more adequate funding of our mental health system. Uh, it's not a, it's not a simple one size fits all answer there. Uh, things that need to be done. I think in New Jersey, uh, leading up to Newtown, I think it was about, I want to say 19 record mental health records had been submitted to the VIC system. Uh, we're now up to date, but it, it was um, grievously uh, underreported uh, until Newtown, and other states are working on getting the record, improving their records as well. We're trying in Newtown to expand the role of the clergy 
on a non-sectarian basis in the schools. So when you see a loner, um, you know, just ignore him and you pay attention to that loner. And um, what Adam Lanza needed was some a really skillful person to say, you know, you're really weird, man, but here's another really weird person that's an actuary and he's good at mathematics like you. So yeah, you're different, but there's a lot of very accomplished, successful people that are really different too. He needed that level of intervention and it, and it wasn't there. Remind everyone that this is this is a question and answer period. And needing to make a statement is welcome to do so at the very end. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ed Gross from the Bergen County Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. I want to thank you for your informative talk and most of all for your commitment to the cause of preventing gun violence. Mandy, you mentioned the uh, child safe law, and I know that there's been a problem in that it seems to uh, trigger, uh, if you pardon the word, the opposition to, uh, to uh, get these guns kept out of the stores. And I know that child safe guns, I, I think it should be something that we're all in favor of. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any, any downside to a child safe gun, but I'm wondering, are you familiar with uh, what's being done on that to try to adjust the legislation so that it doesn't have the opposite effect it was intended? I think Adam would be more Yeah, I, you know, I'll just say quickly, I think uh, there's talk in the, leg in the legislature about adjusting that law to remove the, the, the mandate uh, for, for those uh, firearms to be sold. You know, look, I think there's possibilities of developing new technology. I think, from what I understand, the technology is a very early stage of development. Uh, I think, uh, this is something we'd like to see the marketplace uh, get involved in. Um, it may, may be that that market could develop more quickly without uh, government regulations and, uh, you know, firearm purchasers and firearm owners and users could uh, assess those, those uh, particular models uh, and let the market uh, act as it ordinarily does. Um, uh, as far as I know, there's not any definitive decisions in the legislature, but certainly there's a lot of talk, and I think that's healthy to talk about ways that that will accomplish the goals that I think uh, most of us would agree are, are good ones uh, without potentially uh, causing some of the, the challenges that have, we've seen to this day. I think that law will only be repealed until, you know, um, the gun regulation side sees that um, the gun enthusiast side is um, really willing to let those uh, guns come to market. It's sort of like you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? We're kind of at a standstill, and that's why we need to build trust. The Biden as soon as the police file. Police file. Hi, my name is Ron Schwartz. I'm from Canada. I'm also on the board of the Bergen County Coalition to, to Prevent Gun Violence. About a year ago, we had a forum of our own with uh, several representatives. Senator Weinberg was on it related to gun violence, but there were also members of the Second Amendment Society, which are uh, pro pro-gun advocates on the panel and many in the audience as well. And I remember Judge uh, uh, Senator Weinberg asking the members in the audience, is there a single piece of any type of gun legislation, of gun regulation legislation that you would support? Anything. Give me something that you would support. Even, she asked, would you support not permitting guns to people that are on the no-fly terrorist list? And they would not support any of those. Not a single one. So I'm asking you, because you're a great supporter of dialogue, as I am also. How do you get into this? How do you get someone to agree to anything when they say nothing? We're not going to agree to any type of legislation whatsoever. Where do you start? Uh, where do you, have you found any common ground where uh, gun rights advocates are willing to agree to anything? Where is the start? Is what I'm trying to say. You can't say we're in a defensive mode, like you know, the cat with its back up. They don't trust us. And there's um, good, there's some. How do, you, how do you bridge that? Okay, I mean, there's some good reason. Um, some prominent people have made statements, Sen I won't say names, Senator, Attorney Generals, that um, made statements that they wanted to uh, basically take the guns away. Um, and so they don't forget those statements. And it's like any relationship, we, we have to start from the beginning and build trust 
uh, humanize one another. Any, every conflict can only be resolved when we know each other and respect each other as, as people. And uh, this, this ability, really, that, that that's, it seems like it's a long shot, but that's the only shot that's going to work. Good evening. My name is Stuart Jeffrey from Mountain Science, which means we've already had a gun band in work. Um, um, expanding on the rabbi's point, uh, Mayor Fuller, um, building trust is really helpful. We all abided by the laws as written. New Jersey police have added forms that have been deemed illegal by the courts but continue to use them. How is continuing to use forms that are illegal have been judged illegal by the court? Helping to build trust. Can you explain that, please? Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's important to contextualize for the rest of the people here that uh, um, where your questions come from. It's a valid question. The uh, his questions related to essentially background checks that um, each police department in the state of New Jersey has background checks. New Jersey has background checks. Jersey City's background check as it relates to uh, accessibility to guns is. Um, the strictest in the state where the courts recently ruled and we're going to go through an appeal process that it's, uh, that we went over the line as it relates to um, accessibility. So his question is um, why essentially do I feel that it's appropriate to have something different? Uh, the, the answer yeah, to me... No, 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 sorry, can I, can I, can I yeah. my question please? Go ahead, sure. The, the court has already ruled yeah. that the forms are overreaching and the, the statute is very, very clear about what is allowed and what is not. That's the sixth way to understand it. It's very, very clear. We, I don't we, know. we have a, no, no. As, as, as adding a, to the forms is not allowed by law. Yeah, listen, as in any case, anything that is challenged, not only regarding gun laws, gun advocacy, gun reform, there is a court process for this and there are appeals process for this. And uh, we have a difference of opinion on how we interpret that. And you could say it's very clear, and I would say it's ambiguous. And that's the nature of the court system. And when the initial court well, rules against us, we have no the opportunity to appeal it, like anything else. So, this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, because, because, let me just say, the, 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 because somebody speaks louder doesn't make them more right. Okay, like that's the fundamental difference here. I don't have a microphone. You're no, here. there's a line though, sir. There's a process. You can follow that. So, 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 so we'll go through the process. We'll, we'll go through the process. We'll go through the legal process. We'll follow the process. So you can speak at the appropriate time instead of interrupting. He was a state of the If yes, if yes, uh, family would have guns, he won't be here. I think so. The Warsaw ghetto, Warsaw yeah. ghetto was possible because some people had guns and they wanted to be. Okay. So I'm sorry that your 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 family somehow escaped. Others were killed. Yes, I know. I, excuse me. You're interrupting me. So um, uh, the again, freedom of speech is for everybody, not yeah. only for you. Yeah, sure. Now, as for as for uh, just. Uh, court system, not it's not who is right or who is loud, who wins, but the guy who can hire more expensive and experienced lawyer. So do not give me this this uh, go go away things. The uh, uh, gun laws in in New Jersey are most draconian. Uh, the lady is told here that if the uh, um, uh, woman who had intruder would get a gun, it would be if she expects and all this stuff. Actually, two things. Uh, it is allowed, and you are not liable for the matter, only to use gun if there is a uh, witness, provable uh, case of danger to your life. Otherwise, you can't. Okay? Uh, even if you're in your house, 
if somebody is rolling in the gun in your backyard, but not just shooting at you, you cannot shoot at him. You'll be, uh, well, just uh, accused of murder. Now, again, historically, I know you say mutual rabbi, mutual understanding. The guys from uh, ISIS, okay, they probably follow the rule. They don't use guns, they use knives, okay, to, 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 cut, to cut the heads of the people. So, okay, so here there are no, no gun laws are necessary. Uh, okay, and now you find more and more killings of police, not with guns, but with something simple, uh, well, just knives, uh, well, uh, well, whatever it is. It's not a solution, okay? So the thing is, people should have any guns they need. Yes, people should be checked whether they're reliable and all that, but, yes, but, the thing is that this should not be a registry who has guns or not. Because, again, the right for carry arms was against the um, uh, hostile action of government. In Russia, after the First World War, there was a lot of guns in the country. And when Tambov, uh, well, the region, okay, did not want to take Bolshevik di dictatorship, they raced with his guns, and the government uh, was able to su suppress them only with chemical weapons. Okay, so therefore, you see that this is the, the way of people defending their independence and right to vote and choose what they want. It's not just a kind of only for hunting or how many shots and all this stuff. There is a right to the, do that. Yes, it should be controlled. New Jersey laws are, well, just draconian. For example, the lady on the, on the couch will have a knife. But it's prohibited in New Jersey. I cannot buy a knife. Larger than certain size, I cannot. You see, it's exactly not in New Jersey, New York, and all this stuff. Okay, so therefore, please don't, don't just just give the things. Okay, yes, sometimes the woman with a gun will be shot. But what you say, relax, enjoy, then report to police. Come on, there are such instructions to the women who are raped. Okay, but I, I, I don't think it's, it's great. For some people, some some women. Okay, being raped is worse than, than I'm finishing, again, again, people talk, jokes and all that. So question, question is, why are you trying to limit right of people to defend themselves? The test is never again, never again. For that, for example, I would say pogroms and, and, and uh, um, uh, lynching mobs are possible everywhere. And no examples of having guns prevented that. You cannot do it against government with modern weapons and tanks and all this stuff. But gangs, yes, possible. Therefore, please do not make it, okay, it's guns, knives, uh, bricks, uh, or just uh, irons for, 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 for clothing. Everything can be used to kill people. And you see it again and again and again. Thank you very much. I'm the president of the Coalition of New Jersey Firearms Owners, as well as the owner and operator of the Justified the Need Project. A few things that I want to address at first. Uh, my first, my first thing is with Bob um, and Mandy. Bob, on your website, you've got a form to contact New Jersey Senators saying that we are not required to have a background check before purchasing a long arm. I think the crowd here should know and understand that in New Jersey, in order to purchase a firearm, you have to go through several background checks. The first is by getting your firearms purchase ID card, which is an application to the police, which you go through 21 database checks, as well as mental health, which is supposed to take 30 days, but most police departments don't. Uh, this refers back to Mayor Phillips' comment about additional forms as well. But no citizen Jersey can buy a firearm without that ID card. So one, there is a background check already in place. Your website is false. I wish you would correct that and, take, and as senior counsel, I wish you would address that. <clears throat> to the two gentlemen from the Bergen County Coalition, um, in regards to the child firearms, it's a very simple answer. The law states that it is mandatory that I purchase a firearm governed by the government, not of my choosing of how I choose to protect myself. You get rid of the mandate and let 
let, uh, let um, free market take its place. It will either succeed or it won't. But as long as it is mandated by government that that's all I can own, then it will never go through. <clears throat> I have a question for the panel. As, an, as a citizen, if I choose to go through the proper training, to go through gun safety classes, to go through the background checks, the mental health checks, um, to be fingerprinted, to go into the database, everything that is required under the law, should I be allowed to get a permit to carry a firearm on my person for self-protection? In New Jersey, we have what's known as justifiable need that prior to anybody being give, granted a permit, which is almost non-existent due to our laws here in our courts, the justifiable need says you have to have a special, a special, um, special danger. Well, how do you know when that special danger comes? So my question to the panel is, if a citizen is willing to go through all the hoops that you require us to do, why should we not be allowed to protect ourselves when the police are not required to? That's my first question. Well, I'll, obviously everyone else should answer it, but I'll, uh, I'll answer that first. First of all, thank you for uh, uh, taking a look at our website. I appreciate that. And, and uh, uh, you know, I always appreciate folks raising issues if there are concerns about the accuracy of the information. So we'll take a close look at that. Uh, you know, I, I think your statement of the law was accurate. Uh, it would disagree with you on that. As to your second question uh, regarding uh, concealed carry or, or I believe it, anyway, carry, concealed carry, public carry, um, you know, my, my position and I think the position of, of perhaps many people in this room, uh, a large number of Americans, is that when it comes to carrying concealed weapons in public, I think it's common sense that we ensure that people doing so have a clean criminal record. Uh, and undergo basic safety training, basic criminal background checks, uh, and you know, assuming that uh, that we satisfy those conditions, then I think uh, you know, concealed carry is legal. I understand uh, you may feel that New Jersey's system of permitting or, or licensing is, is far too restrictive. Uh, you know, I'm not going to speak specifically to New Jersey's system, uh, but as I said, I think the basic rules here are that. It sounds like we may agree on that point. That, we, you know, we have no disagreements about all the uh, basic safety training yes, should be required. No uh, and so I think that's a, a, a positive example of us uh, coming to common ground, uh, agreeing on in principle. Uh, so that gives me some uh, some uh, satisfaction to leave here. And thank you for your question. I thank you for coming here tonight and your attention to this issue. No passion. What one aspect of justified need do you think was over the top? Well, the fact that no citizen qualifies for it. In New Jersey, there's only 1,100 permits, uh, 1,100 permits issued for concealed carry over the past 10 years. You were either have to be politically connected or a retired law, law enforcement to, in order to receive a permit. <clears throat> Every person who applies is either told by their local police department, don't bother, you'll never get it, or they are turned down by the court systems. In order to get a concealed carry permit, first your police chief has to agree and say yes. Then from there, it has to go to a superior court judge, and he has to say yes. Ultimately, nobody says yes. We're not in disagreement right. with the, per the process. We're in disagreement with somebody telling us that if we're willing to do it, then let us. Right. But we're not allowed to. Could, could I? No. Please, uh, please, thanks please. for just kidding. I did not know that, so thank you. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm going to get back to you and I want to read a little bit more about the forms to start with, but I do want to just hit one thing because um, I, I have a hard stop at 930, but the, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I wanted to publicly say that I really commend the fact your tone, you had a question, you've been respectful, you've advocated a position that's reasonable, and I just want to say thank you for doing that. Great. Uh, however, there, 
you're uneducated about the laws regarding guns. And that, uh, excuse me, let me, let me go on here, please, okay? And uh, for, so when somebody stands up here and says, well, you know, background checks, background checks, how could anybody be against background checks? And any gun owner in the state knows that they've already had three background checks. So New Jersey has extremely tight laws in this area. If you, if you don't like them, that's fine, okay? Uh, I, and here's my question for the group. Uh, the rabbi, great, fabulous. We need to find a middle ground. Nobody wants dead children, okay? Nobody wants dead children. We need to find the middle ground and satisfy everybody. I'm a little disappointed in the panel because it was supposed to be a discussion on the reduction of crime and violence. And, and I'm not sure I heard from you other than uh, tightening gun rules on legal gun owners, uh, what your plan is. Uh, we, we heard that in Newark, none of the guns were purchased legally. Okay, what are we gonna do about that? I, I think some of them touched on the fact as it relates to some of those loopholes and the concerns as it relates to New Jersey versus other words. I could talk to you from a Jersey City standpoint. Um, when you look at last year, we had uh, 21 homicides. We had several domestic violences and something that was touched on as it relates to accessibility of firearms to people who have had recurring domestic violence issues. Those are ones that I'm sure that you could focus on. And then if you look at the other uh, 20, 18, 17 homicides that happened last year, um, majority of them regarding firearms and the majority of them regarding illegal firearms and accessibility to that. So um, I would tell you that if it wasn't directly addressed in this conversation, saying that that's something that needs to be addressed from a legal standpoint, which I think Mandy actually touched on, um, I think that was directionally where she was going for. I think, just to start with your premise that we're against guns, I think that one of the things that I focus on a lot is talking about responsible gun ownership. And with the Second Amendment rights come responsibilities, I don't think that anything that I said was, was uh, again, would, would mean that a law-abiding gun owner should not be able to have a firearm. So I do try to speak from a position of reasonableness. Um, when I talked about uh, illegal guns in New Jersey, the message is that our federal legislators need to be vocal about the need for better federal legislation with respect to background checks, and that we should be calling on them to make those demands when they're in Washington. So I, you know, in order to fix New Jersey, we have to fix things on a federal level as well. I'm sorry, you're very um, concerned about, you know, the carnage from guns, and you asked us, you know, what we think we could do about it. And clearly, you know, there's gun regulation, but there's also crime control, which is a big component of it. Um, but what what is your, um, I mean, I, I take you on your word, and I, I know that you are equally as concerned about um, the carnage in this country. How do you think we could, you know, as a gun enthusiast, solve the problem? What is your What are your thoughts on it? My thoughts are, yes, you need to have a universal nationalized system for background checks. Uh, you need to tighten up in states where it's very easy to get a gun. Okay, here in New Jersey, it's not easy to get a gun. The system is completely different in 40 some other states. We need a unified system for guns, for the purchasing of guns, and for the carrying of guns. A national system. I think that's uh, I have, uh, I have one more event in Jersey City that I do need to go back to, get the tail end of it. So I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight, whether you're for or against. I, I do think it's inspiring that people are happy. Thank you. So my question is, in New Jersey, if I go to the range, you know, on my way back home, and I go and I take part my gun into seven different pieces, you know, I lock them each in their own box in the trunk of the car. If I then stop the car to take a pee, why is it a three-year sentence? Because it is. This is New Jersey law. It's a three-year sentence if I stop to pee, get a bagel, anything. What? If the gun's unloaded, why? Right. It's because, because of the pee. Because of the gun. Yeah, stop it to pee is illegal. <laughs> it's the gun in the car. Stop it to pee is illegal. Oh no, if you have the permits, you have all the paperwork, you got everything in order, you applied for it legally, if you stop the fee, it's three years in prison. 
Yes. Well, you're not carrying it. It's in the trunk of the car. You're not allowed to stop for anything in New Jersey for no reason other than a police officer pulling you over. It's a three-year sentence. Why is this? You don't have an answer. I want some common sense here. That's all I want. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I too have to express a little bit of disappointment. I came here, you know, hoping to hear some solutions and some ways to connect. And I'm very glad to have heard from you, Rabbi, because I think that you're on to something. I don't have the answers. That's one of the reasons why I came here. Um, but I can tell you that one of the reasons why people are expressing their frustration is that it sort of feels as though this isn't really, we were sold something that we didn't get here tonight, which was a discussion among people uh, who have things to bring to the table. It's an intelligent discussion from points of view that are diverse. That's the only way we get anywhere. If we're listening to only our own voices every single day, we learn absolutely nothing and nothing changes. Now, I am a survivor of domestic violence. I had an ex-husband who attempted to strangle me, and I'm looking at you very specifically, Ms. Palmer. I have a concealed carry permit in the state of New York, and I'm very proud to be a gun owner. There is no doubt in my mind that without the possession of that gun, I am at far greater risk than without it. This was a man who found me 10 years after the attempt he made on my life. No one here needs to tell me how to protect myself because in the quiet of the night, when the door is opening and the hands are wrapped around your neck. Gabby Gifford has her scars. I had petechial hemorrhaging in my eyeballs from what that man did to me. The people who stepped up to help me were the NRA and other women who support the shooting sports and who encouraged and supported me. I accessed your website yesterday and I looked everywhere to find out what is your group about? What are all of these groups about? And I'm getting catchphrases. I see common sense. I hear sanity. I see all of these things. But no one is defining what it is. And then when I saw your statistics, I was very disappointed because there are no citations to any fact. I can't find anything to back up your statistics. And I think that's one of the reasons why there was a problem with some dialogue here and with people shouting out. Because if we don't have credibility, we have absolutely nothing. So my question for you, and by the way, I was a New Jersey resident, I'm now a New York resident. And I'm also speaking on behalf of a friend who was a little frightened to be here tonight because she was afraid someone would know she was a gun owner and she would lose her job. This is a woman whose home was broken into in the middle of the night and she was defenseless. So we have serious problems. My question for you is the same question that that other man asked, but that Mr. Skaggs answered. If I'm meeting all of the requirements of whatever the latest law is that somebody decides to pass, shouldn't I be able to carry a firearm in the state of New Jersey to protect myself. I think I'm, I'm glad that you're standing here today, and I certainly respect your rights as a gun owner, and I'm glad that it's, it's making you feel safe. So I do respect that right, and I, I will always say that I respect the right of gun owners. Um, I think that um, there is a process, and the courts have been making those determinations through that process. Um, and, and I will respect it. I, I believe that more guns equal more gun violence, and the presence of a gun puts more people at risk. Um, and, and so I don't think that adding guns to the situation is necessarily going to make things better. That's my personal belief, um, and, I, and I believe the process is, um, there, it, it's not as if there isn't a process for somebody to petition the courts. But a process that uniformly and unilaterally results in the consistent denial of law-abiding citizens to protect themselves. And by the way, I can agree with you, there's too much gun violence, but if you're taking the guns from me, you are not preventing gun violence. There are criminals all over every state in the union, and by disarming their victims. I don't think we're talking about taking your gun away or disarming. I think, I think we are. I looked at your things. statistics, and I really have to tell you, that's, 
I looked at what you had, and all I read in that is, guns are bad, take them away, or send parents to jail if they, if there's a neg if there's an accident with their child. Well, like, but but that's that's the point that we're making that that shouldn't be deemed an accident. That every right. gun and that's that common ends up in a child's sense to hand ends up goes through the hands of an adult. And that's and common that is, sense. That is to common you. sense to me. Yes. But can I ask you a question? Um, and, yes. and, and this is not to be adversarial because I actually do believe in smart gun technology and um, I welcome the law to change if the industry would step up and say we want to help victims of domestic violence to arm themselves but not have that gun turn against them or used by their child. So would you be supportive of smart gun technology? No, no unfortunately, it, it, okay. it just can't work. That's the problem. I understand that there's a risk every day to myself in what in what I do, but that's part of what you were saying about responsible gun ownership. You, you have to learn how to practice. You have to go to the gun range. You have to have other wonderful women, as some of the women are here tonight, who have helped me more than I can tell you in terms of supporting my ability to safely carry and be able to fire a gun. And then we, you know, and then we, it's, I'm just disappointed in the kinds of responses we're getting. Well, I think that you, I think that it's fantastic that you have found a community. And when you're talking about firearm safety training, uh, I guess now it's maybe almost two years ago that there was a bill pending that would have required a maximum of four hours of firearm safety training, and it was objected to by mem many members of the New Jersey um, gun lobby. Got nothing many many of us have. But, was but, the, but the reason the reasoning was yeah. that it was the interruption of Second Amendment rights, and if you're, you know, that's if, if we're going that's for why responsible get, gun ownership, then, then gun that's why I get the safety training. And that's Nobody makes me. Absolutely. Nobody makes other fantastic. people. I, we need to wrap this up. We'll I the building. I, we have to make it quickly because we actually have to give up the um, the space yeah. at nine thirty. Okay. Over there. Hi. Right, good evening. My name is Alexander Rubian. I'm the president of the New Jersey Second Amendment Society. Uh, I just want to begin by saying that I was appalled by your statement, sir when you made this comment that the Second Amendment Society was at a uh, forum with Loretta Weinberg and we made no compromise whatsoever. That's farthest from the truth, and the reason why I know that was because I was the panelist. And to correct yourself, maybe you had misinformation or misunderstood the conversation, something I never thought that would ever happen was that Blue New Jersey, a very anti-gun progressive website, wrote a glowing report about me. So if any of you want clarification and the truth, not this man's personal opinion trying to attack me, you can just go to bluejersey.com, put my name Alexander Rubian, and it'll come up. Now, once again, I, I attend another one of these forums, which I don't think was fair because you invited nobody from the Second Amendment community to be a panelist. So I don't think that this was a balanced forum. Um, maybe, maybe next time you will. Uh, but Mandy, to your point, you know, I'm holding the National Institute of Justice Report, which is a government organization, and they did a study and they found that four and a half million times a year, law-abiding citizens use firearms for self-defense. But you're making this statement that nobody uses firearms for self-defense. Now, in Oklahoma City, on New Year's Eve, a young woman, a young mother, home alone with a three-month-old baby, a man, a convicted violent felon, kicked down her front door and charged her with a knife. What did she do? She grabbed her shotgun and shot the man, and there was no innocent victims. Now, I can tell you many, many stories like this. So, like, what I get upset about is when you make these statements that are just blatantly biased, because when you look at the state reports, four and a half million times a year, law-abiding citizens can still carry permit holders around the country are using firearms in self-defense. Over 90% of those, just by brandishing the firearm, a criminal approach it and said, you know, they want to attack you and you say, listen, buddy, I don't want to have any problems, and you show your firearm, that deters the crime from happening. I think that's a massive success. What also bothers me is when I'm sent. Uh, you know, I, I need to wrap up. Okay. You, know, so, you know, Ed is sitting over here. Why don't you guys go over and you work it oh, out? Do you mind Ed talking to him and figure out what was uh, communicated then? 30 seconds. I okay. promise, 30 seconds. Okay, my question is, why don't you disclose your true agenda? Because when I'm sent this report that was paid by millions of dollars from Bloomberg, by social scientists and marketing companies on how to manipulate the gun conversation. And there's a big booklet here about doing everything you just did tonight. That's not honest. When it tells people here, always focus on emotional and value-driven arguments about gun violence, not the political food fight in Washington. Still tell stories with images and feelings. That's exactly what you did tonight. 
you are supporting Bloomberg's millions of dollars in this manual. You can go online and download it. And everything she did tonight was from the manual. There's no facts, it's all emotion. And that's what makes me upset. You start forgetting your name, the rabbi, I think we can have a narrative. But when you're misleading people and not telling the truth, that's when I get upset. Okay. So Thank I you very much. Jersey's gun laws that bans slingshots. Repeal the law that bans possession of any firearm in the state except by exemption, giving the burden of innocence, giving the burden of proof uh, to the innocent party. You know, this gentleman talked about not being able to stop and go to the bathroom, but I've had a you know, case is, where a gentleman. Is there, is there was, we have this conversation um, after? Because we're really going to we, we have to give up the, um, the space here. Do you mind if you can say here? Did someone have a, just a, a question, one question? 